day, angels, and welcome to Humanitarian Chronicles, where I highlight extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm Abby Lodmer, conscious comedian, health coach, life coach, here today with a magnificent spirit, Ren Hurst. She is the author of Writing on the Power of Others, A Horsewoman's Path to Unconditional Love, and the upcoming Animal Lover, Restoring Connection to Wild Wisdom. Ren is the founder and visionary director of the New World Sanctuary in Foundation in Southern Oregon and creator of her inspiring YouTube channel, Living in Integrity with Ren Hurst. Ren has undergone an incredible transformation in her life from world-renowned professional horse trainer and hoof care specialist to doing the incomprehensible to many horse lovers, choosing to give up riding altogether. Ren is joining us today to talk about living in integrity with patience, persistence, and a commitment to unconditional love. Thank you so much for being here, Ren, and just for being. I'm so grateful for you. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Abby. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And I don't know about that world-renowned horse trainer stuff, but I oh, at least know well. how to get things done. <laughs> <laughs> well, honey, from what I've researched about you, world-renowned, world-renowned. <laughs> they know her in Russia. They know her in Denmark. They know her everywhere. So I do my research, honey. World-renowned. <laughs> Well, you're so amazing, and your journey is absolutely incredible and so inspiring to me as a vegan, as a sensitive being on this earth. How did you come to the realizations you came to to make you even want to give up your life? I fell in love with a beautiful woman and got my heart wrecked. <laughs> ah, that's what always digs digs into our souls to make us transform. I can relate. Amen. I can to, to the beautiful human part. I can totally. relate. Totally. Totally. Yeah, I mean, it really was. It was a total shattering of the heart combined with um, a spiritual path that I had just started engaging with and trying to figure out the the core of who I was and as a as a human, but also as a an emotional and spiritual being and what that meant. Um, combined with all the trauma from my past and facing it and looking at it and seeing it how how it had developed me as a human and and had led to me making some of the choices I was making in my life, but then also just being a really passionate, super egotistical, highly driven <laughs> horse trainer who wanted to be the best at what she did. And so combine all those things together, bam, reality shattered. Wow. Isn't that so true? Heartbreak will always bring us to the depths. It will yeah. always make us seek for, to find what we really are and who we really are. In the pit of hell and darkness in my worst heartbreak is where I saw the vision for my show, Humor Healing Humanity, so I can absolutely relate to what you're saying. And that's so beautiful. I feel like without without that little stirring inside, how else do we get shaken to the core to say, yeah. wait, why am I alive? Why am I here? What are the choices I'm making? How am I interacting with other souls? Am I going to break hearts? Am I going to hurt people like I was hurt? I mean, it seems like you figured out, you know, it, it made me more empathetic. And it, I feel like maybe it made you more empathetic, too, to well, all beings. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But more importantly, um, you know, we, we think it's love that gets us into these painful things. But really, it's it's the breaking apart of what we perceive love to be so that we can find what it truly is, which is this all encompassing allowing and uh, the ability to understand the true essence of what we really are and how truly connected we each are and being able to create some space in your life to look at our relationship to ourselves, each other, other beings and ask the question, is this what I perceive love to be or is this something else? Oh, man, sister. Oh, man. I love these questions. Your book is so incredible. Actually, I'd love to kick this off. We've already kicked it off. But with a <laughs> quote, when you kick it off again with a quote of yours to just give our viewers a little inkling of what we're talking about here. And then we'll talk about the horses specifically and veganism and everything else, the realizations that you came to sure. in, in the middle of your, your emotional time. So this is from Ren Hurst. Having underestimated the intelligence level of animals for so long and at such great depth, when I was exposed to the truth of what they really were able to understand, being surrounded by them left me feeling like a slave owner. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's no wonder we keep them stupid. Isn't that exactly how we were able to control members of our own species for so long? One will never be able to understand the intellectual capability of another if they are only willing to weigh it against their own understanding of that individual. If we believe animals to be stupid and we keep them under our control, they will be stupid. 
unless we create an environment and a situation where they can advance. I love that quote of yours. And, you know, you were a Liberty uh, trainer as well, yeah. correct? Can you explain what that is? Um, you know, it's a highly manipulative form of horse training, and I know that's not going to earn me a lot of friends by saying that, but that's the truth. Um, oh, well. it's, it's still coercion. It's still manipulation. It's just a deeply shadowy feminine aspect of that. It's a much more insidious way of control and dominance because it's not honest. I mean, when you when you punch a horse and make them do something for you, at least you get to call it what it is. But when you do liberty training and you're using treats and dancing and moving the horse's feet around in some kind of esoteric seeming manner and then calling that true love and connection and respect, you're, it's delusional. Oh my gosh, you have just shattered you you single handedly have shattered so many of my preconceived yeah. notions about what's okay in the world. Well, it's okay. It's just is what it is. And wow. people need to like learn how to stand in the truth of that instead of hiding behind their shadows and um, continually reaching for these animals for a sense of connection they've lost with themselves. Wow, honey, that is so profound. Well, angels, what we're talking about here is Ren decided not to ride horses because why? Well, uh, when I learned to listen to the horse and look for the subtlest no, um, you start seeing no's that are unbelievably small because beings in our care, dependents, much like children, are not in a position to offer the consent for the use of their bodies simply because they depend on us for their survival. And so they're not in a position to say no a lot of the times. So a lot of times a no from a horse can look like just not saying yes. And for those of us that have sexual trauma of our past, we resonate with that very deeply and understand what that looks like. And when I started drawing the parallels between the two, I started seeing the no of the horse bright and clear. But there's a whole other level to this that most people don't understand. Most people's perception of horses is what we know a horse in a domesticated, learned helplessness state to be, which is almost all horses because we control horses every day. We micromanage their existence. So they're kept living in a very small box of what they understand themselves to be, which very much translates into our understanding of who they are. So when you are able to relate to another being in a way that frees them into the full essence of who they are and allows them to truly emerge into a, a fully empowered state, it's mind-blowing who they become. And it's a model for who we each can become if we'd stop letting society, the people around us, the people we care about tell us who we are and who, how we can be. So I stopped riding horses because I don't believe that a dependent in my care needs to have me climbing on top of their body for my own personal desires. That is so interesting, and I, I love that you bring up the sexual trauma because there's so many equine therapy organizations mm -hmm. out there for just that reason, for yeah. women and, and children who have been abused. Who yeah, been so here's where I'm going to make a lot of friends. Okay. My, my current mission is to change that industry and, and, and get them to understand that they are perpetuating a lack of consent in their efforts to heal the trauma of non-consent. Um, and that is just the nature of domestication in general. But right. this isn't about making anything wrong that's already happened. This is where we are at our stage of evolution in humanity. This isn't about looking back and going, oh, God, we're doing these horrible things. That's guilt and shame, and it's not going to serve us into moving into an elevated state in any way, shape, or form. It's really just about getting comfortable enough with your own dark like aspects so that you can find understanding and compassion and stop reaching for others to get needs met that you're not able or willing to meet for yourself. And so when we're taking, especially young girls and children in general, and using horses and therapy to teach them how to overcome their own trauma by perpetuating a more subtle form of the exact same trauma onto another, that's not real healing. That's just teaching life skills to enter into a paradigm that we're actually trying to move away from on this planet. So if you want to continue patriarchy and domination and control, then yeah, go right ahead and follow that same model. But I would like to lead the people away from that that are ready to make some serious change on this world so that we can actually step into the fullness of what we can be as a human species. Amen, sister. Uh, speak on it! Well, yours, <laughs> you know, so the answer to that, I, I suppose, would be going to horse sanctuaries. And yes. going to animal sanctuaries instead of these yes. equine therapy centers where they've got bits in their mouths and, and you know, lassos and whips and saddles and they're exploited, which you talk a lot about. 
So yeah. it, it, I guess that's the answer, and you've created the answer. Well, at least that's what I perceive the answer to be. But I mean, I'm, I'm a one woman show right now wearing about 20 hats that don't fit. But I'm starting to find my people. I'm starting to take this work internationally and speak to audiences that are extremely receptive and find the right team. And it is coming together. People are ready for this because this is coming from truth and love and understanding. This is not about, hey, you're doing something harmful and wrong. I know a lot of vegans like to use my work to attack non-vegans. Apparently, those people haven't read my book because I did all of that harm. That is why I'm such a powerful force and such a big voice in this industry. People like me are your greatest allies. If you can reach out to the people doing the most harm, that have the most power, that are at the, the height of their career in these harmful industries, and you can lovingly embrace them enough to let them draw their own conclusions towards love, you've got a powerful ally, ally that then has a big voice. But if you're out there guilting and shaming people, all you're doing is creating external changes. And that is not where transformation lives. In fact, that's how polarity increases. Because then you've got a bunch of angry vegans that are still feeling guilty and shameful for their own behavior and then lashing out at other people for being exactly who conditioned, society conditioned them to be. This is where we're at. No one's, the world eats animals. You have to accept that. that. We've been doing that forever. That doesn't mean you have to agree with it. That doesn't mean that you have to perpetuate that. But it does mean that you have to at least acknowledge that that's reality. And if we want to fight reality, great. We're going to create a lot of conflict. If you want to create a new reality, you just step into the fullness of who you are and become the example. And that is how effective, that's, that's how things get done. Hallelujah. I, yes, and I have been that angry vegan. I oh, me too. Been, I have been <laughs> that judgmental. <laughs> no, I love your humility. I love that you can just call a spade a spade. I've been that angry vegan. I've been that insane, like, incredulous, I can't believe this is happening before my very eyes put down your fork person. Though, lately I've been, I've been coming, and thanks to you, you're such an inspiration in this area, from more compassion. Like, wait a yeah. second, I was indoctrinated too. I was zzz, airplane yes. some dead corpse in my lifetime too when I was a baby. Like, I was raised in the same indoctrination. I too thought dead carcass was protein at one point. Totally. I, you know, I, I can't, excuse my language, but you know, I came from the same place. So there's the angry vegan cropping up right there. I, it, see it's that? inside I just, of us all because how <laughs> devastating is it to wake up, get new information that makes you think that you're a bad person. Like yeah. nobody's out there eating animals or training horses or doing any of those things with the intention to be abusive, at least no normal person is. Right. And so to have it shoved in your face and shamed for acting in a way that's totally in alignment and totally appropriate for how you were raised and conditioned to believe, that is that is not veganism. Humans are animals too. And when you've got vegans attacking other humans, that is not what this is. This is about trying to do the least amount of harm for the most amount of beings animal beings and and humans are animals and a lot of us tend to forget that because we're not comfortable enough with our own darkness and the own, our own shadows and so you know you do have to go through this self-righteous stage in order to protect yourself when you find out this information that is truly devastating because most of us do not know how to grieve and grieving is the key component to this work oh my gosh oh wow can you please elaborate on that oh, for sure so you know, every time we experience a loss, whether it's a loss in like physicality, like we lose a relationship, we lose our job, we lose a house, whatever, or we lose our sense of understanding how the world works. We lose, like for my case, I lost my entire life. I lost my career. I lost everything I knew to be true about the world by coming to these conclusions. That's why I went to the desert. That's why I lived in the desert off grid for two years with these horses, because I lost everything having seen the truth of this. If I had not taken that time, to emotionally process the feelings around those losses, I would never be able to speak to you today the way that I am with this passion and with this knowing. And none of this for me is coming from, I want to make people wrong or I want people to change. I want people to be free. I want people to know who they really are. And I want people to stop snuffing their essence out by reaching for another to meet needs that they can totally meet within themselves and, and stand in the true power of who we really are. We are running out of time on this planet, in my opinion, and we can waste our time shoving facts down people's throat, shaming them for the behavior they're, they're engaged in, or we can step into the fullness of who we are, heal our pain, grieve our losses, and learn how to love each other. Speak on it. You are amazing. Yes! Well, <laughs> well that being said, I mean, back to what we were talking about before, how is 
horseback riding not vegan? How well, it's a, it's exploitation at best. At best, you are climbing on an animal to derive some sense of something from that animal. Horses do not need to be ridden, nor do they want to be ridden if they have been exposed to freedom. Now, a horse that is only experienced being ridden, and that's the highlight of their time with you, and that's what their limited perception is of connection with you, yeah, of course, those those horses are going to want to be ridden because that's what fun looks like to them. Just like most people in America get up and go to a nine to five job and think that that's like, okay. And I'm like, what is that? Right. Um, well, the other, you know, the other issue ahead. is that they are in a stall all day long. Totally. Would Some they rather are, yeah. be trapped in a stall all day in a stable or For a sure. stall all day long? Or would they rather be out riding, getting their back broken? Exactly. And I mean, their back's not getting broken. It's much subtler than that. And over time, it can be much more extensive. But the physical harm that happens to horses when they're ridden and the owners actually really care about their physique is pretty minimal. It's the exploitation piece, truly, that makes it really fundamentally non-vegan. Domestication is not a vegan concept. And that gets really lost in translation somewhere here. It's not vegan to own an animal for your own needs. And almost all of us bring animals into our lives to meet some emotional need outside of ourselves or to ha derive a sense of unconditional love that we've never experienced from our parents or our partner or we can't give to ourselves. Otherwise, why would we do it? I mean, why would you want to keep someone in captivity? But that's what we do in our relationships. That's just the general paradigm of love on this planet right now. It's time to shatter that reality. We don't need to be playing God without God consciousness and creating beings to love us because we forgot how to love ourselves. Oh my gosh. Yes, I could not agree more. I could not agree more. And I do have a dog because our friends were moving to New York and we took her in because she couldn't be trapped in a little stall right. called a Manhattan apartment. So well, she... let me say that. I'm not saying don't have pets. I'm, I'm saying don't create pets. So we, there's, there's the wild. billions of animals on this planet that need our help. They need our care. Right. Absolutely love them. Love them. And the work I do teaches you how to consciously love them oh, and step that. into a full relationship with them. And through that work, you no longer want to to do that anymore. Like I, the the biggest challenge of my life right now is I'm I'm surrounded by animals I used to exploit and enslave, and that I needed to feel okay in the world. And through the practice of my work, I am more whole and more healthy internally and externally than I've ever been in my entire life. I'm not in a relationship right now. I feel amazing. My life is unfolding in beautiful ways. But I still have to take care of these animals because I brought them into my life and I'm responsible for them. And I have a lot of animals. That's what created the vision for the sanctuaries. Because as people wake up to an to a more elevated paradigm of love, we're going to need answers. What do we do with all these animals? No, you don't just turn them loose and let them like destroy the planet and themselves. That's ridiculous. We take responsibility and we derive benefit from it while also benefiting them by learning how to consciously relate to others. And it's much safer to practice that with animals before we take it back into our human relationships, which we all know how challenging that is. So. Wow. Well, and I have to, well, the reason I brought up my dog is because she's vegan Except, yeah. except that I let her free because I want her to have as much freedom as possible till the cops knock on our door and say they're going to take her away. Another video. But I let her <laughs> free and she comes home eating squirrels or she'll find uh, baby dead birds or dead rodents in the backyard and she'll eat them. Sure. And, and, you know, people give her meat treats all the time. So she's getting her, her tocotrinols or whatever uh, that, that is that's in meat that she's not getting from vegetables. But point being is I couldn't come to the point where I was exploiting other factory animals or even yeah. organically raised murdered animals to feed my animal. I couldn't rationalize that. How do you how do you take care of one animal feeding that animal corpses thousands and thousands of corpses of other animals? It doesn't make sense. And dogs I personally can be don't. vegan. <laughs> right no, I don't. My animal my dog is vegan for the most yeah, part. Again, until too. she'll go get what she feels that she wants to snack on out in the wilderness. I don't I don't look. Yeah. But at least she doesn't kill deer. Um, but no, I, I love the sound of your sanctuary, and I actually would love to know more about your vision that you write about for the sanctuary. You talked a little bit about it, but what goes on there? It sounds well, like it's not a developed place. thing um, at all. I, I'm literally like a one-woman show most of the time, wearing 20 hats that don't fit, and I, I have more on my... I mean, if you read my book, you know my story. I left my career and, and took responsibility for 35 animals. How we get by, I don't know. I work. I do whatever I have to do to take care of them. I do the absolute best I can. I have help come and go. 
Um, but I'm trying to develop a, a worldwide vision of a nonprofit. I'm trying to take care of all those animals on a daily basis. I'm trying to develop my own work, which is this relationship work. And I'm trying to do all of these things all on my own. So it moves relatively slowly. But I mean, I, from the outside looking in, it actually is going quite well. Thank God. Um, Thank God. And I'm writing another book right now that should be done this month that will actually teach people what this work is and why it's so important. But so to answer your question, you know, we've got a very undeveloped small piece of property that we now own free and clear in Southern Oregon. We're starting over because I've, I've got to find the right team that really understands what this work is that is going to be in full alignment because integrity means everything to me. It's like if, if somebody has better information than me, bring it to me. I will shift and change like the best of them. That's how I got to this place. But the, the truth is, is most people want to change out of fear rather than... <laughs> Yes. being courageous enough to look for the truth. Absolutely. And, you know, so what it is right now is me trying to get out there as much as possible and teach what the work is to people already in a position that already have structure in place, already have a team in place. Um, I'm trying to get the work out there so that we can get some fully established um, physical locations going because mine is just, you know, we're, I'm just, I'm mostly trying to feed the horses. So most of the donations that come into the foundation literally go right in the horse's mouth. And about 50% of those donations are coming from me in whatever way I can bring money in. Um, and that's fine for now, but it's, it's a process. <laughs> well, okay. So I guess I was reading your vision and in yeah. my mind, because I'm also visionary, I wanted it to be a reality, and it is a reality. It is. It's it just totally is. The physical world is taking a little bit slower time to catch up to our amazing visions. But I'll just read it. I'll just read it. This is Ren's vision to support a global network of like minded spaces offering sanctuary, vegan education, and various healing modalities to restore connection to all life on the planet. And of course, Ren came to this through her work with horses and love of horses. Ren's mission is to inspire love and raise consciousness through an undomesticated relationship with all human and non-human animals. She is an interspecies relationship coach and consultant. What do, okay, so what does that entail? That you're an It means that if you've got a dog in your home and you want to know what this is, um, I can either Skype or come into your home and work with you one-on-one -on -one to apply these principles I've developed that keep you authentically in an unconditionally loving relationship so that you're not using them to meet some need of yours, which is what most relationships are. Most relationships are codependent relationships, and that's, that's just the truth. And uh, that's why we struggle so much. So all I do is teach you how to move out of codependency and into true love. Oh my gosh, I love that. Um, well, actually, I've I've read somewhere, I, I, I've read parts of your book, I haven't read the whole thing, mm -hmm. about the 13th horse. And yeah. And how, how, yeah, I mean, how you, besides the heartbreak, which brings us to our knees and forces us to question everything about life, which I, I love that you brought that up, but there was a specific moment where, yeah. where the ball started rolling. Could you share that with us? Yeah, um, my heart was broken because of this loss of relationship, which I clearly created in my life. And um, I'm out there working with Shay, um, and I can't use any control with him because that's the modality I was practicing. I was trying to learn how do I work with this horse with no means of control. And because I was so sad and shattered, I was trying to control him because I was trying to restore my sense of connection. And I really wanted to, to feel whole again because my heart was broken. And I, he was reacting so violently to my trying to control him and manipulating him. And in that moment, it all became clear. Oh, my God, this is what I've been doing in all of my relationships. This is what I've been doing in all of my life. This is why this person couldn't be with me or, or whatever. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is what we all do. And in that moment... I literally did. I dropped to my knees sobbing and instantly he dropped down. He had been rearing up and, and um, posturing to threaten me because he wanted me to back off. And in that moment, he dropped down on the ground very softly, came over and gently rested his head on my chest. And I just my entire sh reality was shattered. I, I understood that I was actually creating all of the misfortune in my life, at least half of it. <laughs> wow. That is so beautiful, and I've read so much about like spirit animals, and every animal has different characteristics and different things they represent, and it's funny, it's not funny, you probably know about this, but so many teachings about horses, which is why they're used for therapy as therapy mm -hmm. animals, are that they are the animals. I mean, that's why Pegasus is in the, yeah. the story, the Greek story, about when Pegasus stomped her foot upon the ground, um, 
the waters of, of hope and love and faith and integrity started flowing and interconnectedness started flowing. And if you drink out of the, the you know, mountain where Pegasus stomped the foot, you would become more like that. So yeah. like throughout the, the ages in myths, horses are known as being the most empathetic and what you were talking about, which I love as a, as a metaphysical life coach, the mirror. They are, yeah. they are talked about as being total mirrors of our emotions, yeah. total mirrors. So well, here's why, yeah. um, no one understands this part. The reason we are so drawn to horses as opposed to other animals, our horses are the only animals that we keep in our backyards that are so closely related to their wild counterparts that they haven't lost a significant amount of their essence. So we recognize that on some level, that's what they're actually mirroring. Yet in therapy models today, we're using their conditioned state to mirror our bullshit most of the time. Totally. So but what we're drawn to in horses is what's actually true, what we, which what we have forgotten about ourselves. We're drawn to their power because we've totally lost our own power because we think power is an external thing rather than an internal thing. Oh my gosh, I need to go to Oregon. I need to go to Southern <laughs> Oregon and get a counseling session with you for the, for the health of my relationship with myself, my love, and my dog, my parents, everyone. You're so it's, it's, amazing. It's hard work. I mean, I only know these things because I'm doing it to myself. And I'm, I, I mean, people ask me all the time, what is it that you actually do? And I'm like, you know, I live my life as fully as I can to become a fully realized human being. And I share that process with others vulnerably and openly because. I have no desire to make anyone wrong. This work is so not about making you feel bad. We all already feel like shit. The last thing I want to do is make you feel bad about what you're doing. But you got to know the truth if you want to move away from the things that are keeping you trapped in domestication. Amen. Amen. Well, actually, on that note, I know that you mentioned before that it, domesticating horses, of course, when you're not doing liberty training, I think liberty training is without tools am i right without whips and bits and well without physical tools yes okay but it, it's still bribery and coercion and treats Total. Yeah. okay so it can be it's a, i mean it every time we use a label we we limit our perception of, of that thing and how much it can grow even vegan i really don't like the word vegan because i am a common ground kind of person and yes i am vegan but i am vegan as a result of this work i'm not stamping vegan on my head just like i'm not a i'm not gay either at all <laughs> just a human being right and so and even that is a label i'm not just human either i'm also a spiritual being having a physical experience right. so you know we want to be really careful with semantics here because we're, there's not enough language to cross both paradigms mm -hmm. but to to simplify things so liberty training to me is the externalization of the desire for for a connection without control but just by the very nature that we control every aspect of these animals' lives, it is not liberty. Okay, I love it. Well, you know, it, they're huh, wild horses, baby. Let's get back to the garden. Wild horses. But, well, I brought that up. Is Alex Netsorov, Netsorov is he the one that does liberty training? No, he would never call that. And he, he's actually moved away from working with horses this way anyway for the same reasons I have. I followed his path. He, right. That so whole, much of what I learned from him, I was like, well, shoot, he's told, I don't, I really don't need to do every step that he did because it makes total sense. Now there are things that he's missing in terms of the bridging it into other realms of life because his interest is in horses or at least where Nefzerov Okol is concerned. So, um, he doesn't necessarily have a deep love for humanity. And I mm -hmm. think that is a real obstacle to how far this work can go if we start creating separateness between these species in that way. Um, we can't idolize one species and really not and disown our own. That's right. Speciesism, Martin Luther King, read up on it, people. And yet that's what vegans do every day when they're shaming non-vegans. You're right. I got a hand. You're right. Oh my gosh, when you're right, you're right. Now that's what I love about you. You cause me and others to look at ourselves. Look at the mirror. How are, yeah. you, how are you acting like a, um, an exploiter? Just because you're living right and there's no dead animal at the end of your fork doesn't mean you're not exploiting people, exploiting. I mean, oh, listen, it's been a challenge. Even. It's been a challenge yeah. for me. But like I said, I just have to get back to, wait, I used to be like that. I have to have compassion. Like you talk about getting into the core of us. I've got to keep reminding myself, have compassion for little ignorant Abby. Have compassion, compassion, compassion. But the reason I brought all that up is because 
you mentioned that it's not even about the physical harm to horses. It's more yeah. about the exploitation and the spiritual ramifications and to ourselves and yes. to them. Though yeah. I do want to read a quote from Alex Net, Net I can't even, Netzarov about it. And I'd love for you to comment because I have sure. read a lot about the physical harm to horses that people say, Oh, it doesn't hurt. They're such yeah. big animals. It, it, well, here we go, people. A horse's back is not a seat, not a place for a human butt, not a piece of meat, not some sort of terra firma. It is a very complex and tender anatomical structure with extraordinary functions. Besides the obvious biomechanic function, the back has another very important function. The spinal cord's work is to guarantee that the responses from the entire nervous system can communicate the, se can communicate the senses of smell, taste, vision, hearing, and vestibular function to the brain. On this especially vulnerable, sensitive organ, onto the medulla spinalis, the brain of the back, sits a writer. My um, computer changed a bunch of words. <laughs> my computer didn't understand my biology. But, yeah, I mean, I'd love for you to comment on that about the spine yeah. of, of the horse and the stuff we put in their mouths, whipping them, spurs, totally. all that. Just touch on that a little bit. Yeah, and I, I don't ever mean to downplay those things because that is really important information to know. And I definitely needed it on my journey to come to these conclusions. It really was a combination of things. The problem I have with focusing too heavily on that is that's not the problem. That's a symptom of the problem. Right. And it's just like my sanctuary is not a rescue. It's not an animal rescue. Rescues treat symptoms, and we need that. That's absolutely necessary. But that is not my work. My work is going to the core of what is creating these issues because I have a, a really deep sense of urgency to move something on this planet right now. And I don't think we're going to do that only treating symptoms. Right. So for people that come to me and want the information about the scientific harm, I'm like, go read books. It's out there. How do you think I learned it? It's everywhere. All you have to do is really want to know the truth. And you'll find the truth of the harm of riding horses. It is out there everywhere. It's just not out in your face because the industry doesn't want you to know that. It's a bigger industry than the motion picture industry. Why the heck would the horse industry want to be publishing documents that tell you how harmful and destructive your love for your horse is? That's not going to sell. So, I mean, that's not the issue for me. The issue is why are you trying to get on a horse to feel a sense of freedom in your life? Wow. Well, it's, it's kind of like the argument that we did touch on before, but it's like, but my horse does communicate to me that she loves being ridden. That yeah, with those people, if that's what you believe, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Because clearly, if you were that happy in your life, you wouldn't believe that. Wow, honey, you are amazing. Well, everybody, read up on the harm that that happens to the horse when you sit on its spine. It is, okay, thank God jockeys are, are small people. Thank yeah. God. That's all I have to say, okay? <laughs> It's not okay. It doesn't make it right. My friends always invite me to the derby. No, thank you. I'm like, uh -huh. A, foolish looking hats won't do it. B, exploitation of beautiful creatures that need to be wild and free in their packs with their families, with their alphas, just like other creatures, just like us. We need to be free and liberated in our packs, with our communities, with our matriarchs, you know, with our mares. Yeah. And, and some stallions. <laughs> Well, and the only way we're going to do that is get back in our bodies and out of our heads. So when we wanted to get into these topics about facts and science and blah, 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 it's all distraction. It's relevant. It's information. It's, yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. But when you want to get into a debate over the science of the harm of riding horses, I'm just looking at it like, like why are you trying to justify something like that anyway. I mean, what, what is the, you're, you're clearly deriving a need from this horse. Why don't we just get to the crux of the matter, which is what need of yours isn't being met that you need to go outside of yourself to, to get it instead of spending hours and hours and hours debating whether or not it's harmful to ride a horse. Yeah. Well, I love, I love that you call us all to go there. And I also, there. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. That's what I love about you. Yeah. That's why you're here. Hello. But I also love, I mean, I also acknowledge, and it's like the medical, you know, mafia. It's like the medical industrial complex. Same exact thing. I could be talking to a doctor who's awakened right now. It's the yeah. same thing. It's like, 
yeah, we do need to talk about the reason why these powers that be are controlling and playing eugenics games with right. humanity. But we also need to talk about, wait, every time you go get a test done at the doctor, it's harmful. Every test is harmful. Every x-ray and scan is harmful. So, right. you know, I just, I like, I personally like to come at it from always, but I love yes. what you're saying yeah. that, yeah, focusing on the physical is just a symptom. Why do you want to strap painful things on a horse? Why? Why? Why do you want to well, put... Well, one, you don't know that it's painful. I mean, well, and that's, that's the thing, I, like, I I'm, I'm really here to be a bridge because it's the most interesting thing that has happened from all of this and who I've become is how many vegans love me all of a sudden, even though five years ago I was doing everything that most of them can't stand to even look at. And not only was I doing it, I enjoyed it. I really, really derived a huge sense of power from being able to control 1,500 pounds of muscle underneath me. And I'm just going to be honest about that. And I got so much from this what I called love for horses. And I did horrible things like when I look back on it. And yet, now that I've changed, everyone likes me. So when I see vegans attacking non-vegans, I'm like, wow, I'm not so far removed from that person that I don't feel your anger coming at me. And I get really defensive over the horseback riders. But the horseback riders don't know that because vegans are using my work to shame horseback riders. This next book that's coming out is going to end all of that polarity, at right. least as much as I know how to in written language, because that's not what we need to be doing. We need to learn how to love ourselves so we can love each other. And when we love ourselves and each other, we don't do shit that harms the planet. Oh, honey, you're so amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank who? Thank the woman who I thank the woman who broke your heart. <laughs> to, and, I thank and her every day too. We're back my, in each other's lives now. Right. <laughs> oh, as as well as my heartbreaker as well. But no, I, I thank these people for bringing us to the core of who we are and yeah. challenging us to really um, dissect or analyze or whatever what love really is and how we get it. Because obviously, if our heart was broken that deeply, it wasn't really that deep a love. It was codependence and exactly. expectation. If it's real deep love, you want the best for that person. And if breaking up with me is the best for that person, sorry. that ain't And love. on that note, if, if it's real love for your horse, why does the idea of not riding them make you crazy? Wow, honey. So, I mean, if you're that attached to climbing on that animal's back, that's, that's something to pay attention to. Because the horse doesn't need you on top of them to have a profound connection. And we just don't understand what's possible. Like, people ask me all the time, well, if you don't control your horses, how do you get their feet taken care of? Blah, 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 blah. When you have a beautiful relationship with somebody, they trust you to take care of them and do things that you ask. But with, with, with power like that comes a great amount of responsibility. Because these are dependents in our care. So it is not okay for us to take advantage of them. Aho. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Well, I love, love what you're doing with your life. I'm so grateful for the work you're doing to hold us all accountable for our own feelings and our own actions upon this earth. And I love that you are vegan. <laughs> I love the realizations you've come to and, and the proof is in the pudding. Your sanctuary and the retreat space that you've created for the horses that you once exploited and abused you said it. Um, yeah, totally. Uh, is is a living testament to what you've come to, and you. I, I mean, I'm assuming you've experienced the. You said it's so much deeper and greater. Oh. What what these animals give us yeah. when we don't climb on their backs. Well, let's just say you don't walk away from a six figure career in horse training and holistic horse care to go sit in the desert because you shamed yourself. I <laughs> I had it made. I mean, everything was fine. And, uh, you know, it's the best thing that ever happened. And I lost everything just to be able to become who I really wanted to be. And so it's not been easy. I mean, this has been, I, the reason I do this work is because I don't want another person on this planet to have to go through the amount of suffering I had to go through to find myself again and to come to these conclusions. Nobody should have to go through this much pain and suffering. I mean, for the last four years, it's been a constant struggle to take care of 35 animals that I no longer need to feel good in my life. And so I would have never chosen to consciously bring that. I don't even have any desire to have a personal relationship with an animal in captivity any longer. So, wow. you know, this has been a really rough road. So when people get angry at the things I say, I'm like, you don't know anything about me or what I've done to get to this place. And all I want to do is help you get there, too. Oh, my gosh, babe. 
Amen. Please let Ren Hurst help you. Please <laughs> read her books. Please watch her videos. They inspired me to the core, starting with the first radio interview I heard of her, and I cannot get enough of your wisdom. And how can we find you, and how can we, how can we get more of you? Well, um, I'm available. Uh, my email is truthlovecourage at me.com. That's the easiest way to reach out to me directly. Um, I have a website developing. It is not online yet, but it's undomesticateyourlife.com. And uh, that's where you will soon be able to find me for consulting and coaching. And um, I'm already starting to travel internationally and do speaking engagements and workshops. When the new book comes out, I plan to tour the U.S. at least and, and show people what this is because it's through the experience of it. It's through the demonstration that it really hits home because as long as it's just up here intellectual, it just sounds like a bunch of woo-woo crap. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's very practical. It's very logical, and it works 100% of the time. Um, other than that, the, the foundation's website is newworldsanctuary.org. 100% of the donations that are coming through there right now just go to take care of these animals. We don't have staff. We don't have structure. All we have is a bunch of animals that we have to feed right now. <laughs> and eventually, hopefully that'll grow into something really profound. We want to create a training center where people can come out here and experience this work. I don't, I'm never going to stamp this with my name or a technique. This is love. This is not Wren. Wren didn't make up any of this. This is just Wren's interpretation of, of, what's been offered to me and through experience. So if, if you're ready to go there and you, and you have a gift at facilitating other human beings, then come learn from me and go spread it as wild, as wide, as far as you can. Oh my gosh. I'm on my way. Filling up my <laughs> tank on my way. It's in Ashland, right? Yeah, totally. Okay, babe. I mean, there's not much way. of a sanctuary to speak of, but I mean, the sanctuary is within each of us. So just come spend some time with me and get, we'll get in front of an animal and I'll show you what it is. Oh my gosh. Okay. Experiential is the way to go. We, I'm ready. I'm on my way, honey. I'm sold. You're just, nice. You are such an inspiration, Ren. I just appreciate you. your, your wisdom and the work you're doing so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Stamp love on your forehead. Not anything else. Love. Read Ren's books. They will touch your heart to such depths you can't even believe. And go scope her out. Make the trek to Oregon, and anytime you're in Seattle, you have a place to stay. Okay, Ren? Awesome. Come I'll on the book you. tour up here. You're amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. You are absolutely the humanitarian that I needed to chronicle. So thank you for sharing your heart and your love with us, mere mortals. Thank you, Abby. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Amen. Love to the horses. Yeah. <laughs> Take care.